I will say that brand is way too important to leave it to marketing. And that means that the entire company needs to get behind it. It's not a marketing project. If you want to stand for something, and that's what brand means. Brand is what people say after you leave the room. Jeff Bezos they sort of famously quoted as saying that. Brand is what people say about you once you've left the room. And it goes for people and companies. You want to be known for something? It can't just be slapping some lipstick on the website and, oh, now we have a purple brand. No, if you want to be a brand known for creating raving fans, then your recruiting coordinator needs to create raving fans when she sets an interview. And the tech support engineer, she needs to create raving fans when she's solving someone's ticket and making sure that they're happy. And then marketing can build upon that and be the custodian of the brand and externalize that. But you can't create that in a vacuum. Good point. Hey, Uri, great to have you on the show. I've heard many great things. Thanks for having me, Ricky. Happy to be here. Awesome. Dirty, take us through your journey and how did you get into the tech world? I was born and raised in Israel. And I remember as a kid doing some summer internship at my dad's office who was in tech for all of his career. And I saw a bunch of people sitting crouched in front of their computers typing. I'm like, this looks like the most boring job in the world. I'm never going to be in tech. So much for famous last words. At the end of my army service, as many of army service is compulsory in Israel. So I was in an artillery unit and at the end of my army service, a few months before I was, was going to leave anyway, I got a call from a company who had just won a big military contract to develop a, a simulator for the rocket system that I happened to specialize on. So I'm by no means a rocket scientist, but I was a rocket operator and um, they were looking for product manager to come in and, and help them uh, build the simulator to be as true to form as possible for the technicians that are going to use it. So that's how I got my way into tech, just straight from the army into that product management role. Did a couple of product management roles after that, and then decided that uh, product managers, I, I have a lot of sympathy for them. They have to deal with all the crazies on the customer side and then all the mm -hmm. crazies on the engineering side, and they don't speak the same language at all. The customers are just like, why can't I just have this do that tomorrow? And the engineers are like, I don't understand what they want. This is what we build. They should use that. And so I was in that position for quite a few years and I decided I actually enjoy the customer side more. So that's how I ended up creating my first marketing leadership position and it's been doing that over and over again since. So obviously I'm, I'm not very good at many things, but marketing I figured out for the last few years. One of the things like we always talk to, to young people about, they get into a spot in sales or in marketing and you, you have that six month interview afterwards. Like, how's everything going? That's great. It's really good. Where do you want to end up? I want to be a CMO in six months. Career progression is super important to people nowadays. Is, is there anything you can look back on? Obviously you've had a long career. Where, is there any pivotal moments that you've had that were like, hey, that led you towards going, yeah, leadership in SaaS companies is where I want to end up? Yeah, I think that pivotal moment was inadvertently ending up with the right mentor as my manager. So a few jobs ago, I ended up at a company called Panaya, where the CMO was a guy named Amit Beto, who worked with me previously at a company called Click Software, where he was also the CMO, but we didn't work directly together. And then someone put us back together when I was looking for my next challenge, and he was just starting at Panaya, and he hired me. And I was fortunate to work under his leadership for four or five years, and that really set the tone for kind of the, the rest of my career. And when he moved on to take on his first CEO role, I stayed on a little bit and then did, did my own thing at a couple of other places. And then seven years ago, he called me and said, hey, remember that crazy idea I told you about six months ago? We built a product. We called it Gong, and uh, we just have a few beta customers who became paying customers. Can you come? start helping us marketing this? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And so this is the third company that Amit and I have worked at over the course of the last 25 years. And that, that was a pivotal moment, just getting a right mentor that could teach me lots of good lessons about both marketing and leadership and being an executive. That really set me up for the second better part of my career. That's pretty awesome how you and Amit got to work together so many times. Udi, now that you've touched on Gong, one thing I've found really incredibly powerful is that how you've been able to go on this massive Jaker. Can you take us through some of the marketing strategy that you deployed in the business to go from literally zero to what now 200 million plus in, in a yeah. short period of time? Yeah. 
the goals of marketing, some of them stay constant, but some of them change throughout the stages of the company. So when I showed up, we, we had nothing. Imagine zero traffic to the website, zero social followers, zero email subscribers. Good luck. <laughs> that's the exciting stage. That, that, that's what I enjoy and, and like figuring out. And so one, one of the things I enjoy doing is, and, and I think I heard this from me or someone else in the past, is that great marketing makes your company appear to be two years ahead of where it really is. And so what can you do to look like you're punching a league above and playing with the big boys and girls? And we had to figure out some stunts to, to do that and do that on a budget. So that was one of the first fun challenges. And one of the ways we found of doing that, but also starting to drive real demand gen was with content marketing. So if you go search on Amazon for books on sales, you'll see there's over 100,000 books on sales. So it's tempting to say the world doesn't really need another book on sales, right? But if you dive a little deeper, the most of those books were written by someone who had an experience at Salesforce or Xerox or somewhere else and wrote about their experience. So it's more a biography than a framework for how to build a sales team and how to conduct sales and what data says really works and doesn't work in sales. So we thought since we're, we already have 11 customers at that point at Gong, and we had a few thousands of their sales calls, we thought, what if we could uncover something in the data that would be interesting for people to read about what works and doesn't work? And that's what we set about to do. And we quickly started uncovering insights like if you speak for 46% of the time, you're more likely to get that next call than if you speak 80% of the time. And a good discovery call usually has four to 11 questions. You ask more than that, the person feel like they're being grilled. If you don't ask enough, they don't feel like they're being heard. And we started uncovering these insights and I took the first five and put them in a, I literally had a five slide PowerPoint. I saved it as a PDF, called it the five secrets of the perfect pitch. And that was my first white paper or ebook, whatever you want to call it. And I started sending that out by email and putting some ads on LinkedIn for people to download it. And people were interested. People were interested. And when we posted that stuff on social, they were commenting like, oh, because my experience is, either been like this or not like this, but it created a conversation. And we realized we were onto something and that kind of guided our content strategy that continued many years later. We're still going strong with the Gong Labs content series that has since been turned to a full-fledged blog with hundreds of thousands of subscribers, a LinkedIn newsletter, a podcast, webinars, speaking opportunities that have resulted from a lot of that research data. And people are still eating it up because sales for many years was behind many other go-to-market professions like marketing. And marketing has been data-driven for many years, right? I'm old enough to be doing marketing long enough to remember the years where if we designed a nice trade show booth, had a nice brochure and a website, that was enough. But for the last 10 or 15 years, a lot more has been expected from marketers. You need to know your conversion rates and your website traffic and your cost per acquisition and cost per click and all that. But sales have been allowed to live in the middle ages, if you want to call them that, for way too long. And they were making opinion-based, gut-based decisions rather than looking at data and saying, here's what's working, here's what's not working. Marketing can A-B test a website copy. Why can't sales A-B test a sales pitch? How do they know if Sarah's pitch is better than John's pitch? And that's what Gong allows sales teams to do. and we got that message through the content and the thought leadership that we put out there showing what the data actually shows works and doesn't work. And people got very excited. And so in early days, when you don't have a lot of budget, doing organic content that you can spread almost virally on organic social media and on your organic email list, and then get invited to speak at conferences without having to sponsor them because you actually have something valuable to say, that was maybe our biggest growth hack. Gong's turned into such an iconic brand. Everything about it, from your social content stuff to the branding that you do on NASDAQ and everything that's in between. Was there something you set out to do from the get-go and you reverse engineer it? I'm asking for tips for founders who are in the early stage setups. Like, what's your mission to begin with and how do you work backwards or does it just happen over, over time? Yeah, absolutely. So we did set out with a big, hairy, audacious goal of becoming the authority on what works and doesn't work in sales. That was the marketing goal of the brand that we were building. And, and we broke that down into 
how are we going to build a content strategy that supports that? And how are we going to build a, a, a visual brand and a tone of voice that supports that? So w- one example of, of a conscious decision that we made is we, we looked at other websites in B2B and especially in, in sales tech. There weren't that many companies back then. And they all looked and sounded the same. They, they used what, what, what Danny on my team used to call Series A Blue, which pairs beautifully with whites and grays. And there, were time in, there was a point in time where all the websites looked like that because people thought they looked important or authoritative. I just thought they looked boring. And so we went, okay, if everyone's using blues and whites, why don't we use bright pink and purple? Because that hasn't been done yet. Today, you might see a lot more websites in those colors because I think B2B has evolved and they've seen brands like Gong who have pioneered taking these more evocative approaches to brand, just like B2C sites and, and brands have been doing for many years. And now others are, are doing the same. So that was one decision we made. In general, I could say we wanted to be an authority, but we did not want to be uh, stuck up and condescending, which is what a mm. lot of brands come off as. If you read their posts, they sound like they're writing a white paper for Gardner. They don't sound like they're talking to a friend at a bar. So we wanted to combine the authority with that feel of talking to a friend at a bar, a helpful friend at a bar that doesn't just talk about themselves, but actually cares about you and wants to help you with a problem you might have and and give you some good advice. So we managed to do that, I feel, both in the visual brand, in the content that we put out there, and in the tone of voice that we use, which always had a lot of humor, was always a little bit cheeky, sometimes goofy. And that has also evolved as we went from serving smaller customers to mid-market and now enterprise and some of the largest strategic organizations in the world. But we've always kept that lightness of the tone. You, you won't see people in business suits shaking hands on our website. That's a huge no. It was always crazy bulldogs and people just wearing jeans and t-shirts like most of us go to the office. Look, I'll say in, in my experience, like you guys are very approachable, right? You're happy to chat and talk to people and help people and get involved and in that your brand has always given off that sort of impression. And so I know one of the things we talked about before is your title, Chief Evangelist. Is that the culmination of all of the things you just talked about, right? Leads to your job now. What does that entail? I I have to admit, it's probably a a title that I'm now aspiring to. I like that title. I've done see that once. Chief Evangelist next. There are additional Chief Evangelists out there. I'm not the first, so I did not make up the title, but I, I really like it because it really combines a lot of the things that I love doing. So three of the top things that I do these days are one, a lot of speaking opportunities. This is not my first podcast today. Uh, <laughs> several of them every week. I think last quarter I, I finished 25 speaking opportunities. So every right. week I'm doing in-person conferences, I'm doing webinars and podcasts. And as my husband always says, he's very grateful when I get an opportunity to lecture outside of our home. So <laughs> as many of these as I can. Two, I do a lot of executive alignment calls with other CMOs and CROs that are either using Gong or considering upgrading to Gong, and they want to learn from an executive point of view, what's the best way of getting insights that are actionable. So I talk about my time as CMO and how we use Gong to measure the adoption of our product marketing's talk tracks, how we measure the efficacy of them. Are they actually better or worse? If you remember, that's the A-B testing analogy that I gave earlier, now it's a reality. Now sales team can do what marketing teams have been doing for the last 15 or 20 years. And the third thing I focus on these days is an influencer program that I'm running with a couple of dozen of the top sales influencers in the industry. And they are helping us launch and usher out a a beautiful new product called Gong Engage. And they're taking part in our podcasts and, and webinars and doing a bunch of things together. So also enjoying running that program. So yeah, these are things that I, I did part of them part-time when I was CMO. Now I get to focus most of my time on them and I'm, I'm having a really good time. I felt super special to you said you've done uh, 25 of these in that month. <laughs> That's the best for last. That's for last. <laughs> That's it. I want to switch up the gear up here a little bit. I, I, one of the posts that I read that you wrote on LinkedIn was about knowing your CMO's coffee if you're CRO or vice versa. Synergy in B2B SaaS businesses, especially in sales and marketing, is difficult to achieve. There's always a healthy tension, which you want, but sometimes we don't see eye to eye. What advice would you give to those who are setting up those teams early on and the function and the composition setup and how to ensure that as you progress, that you get the synergy 
all the way through the organization. So you run, run, don't run into these problems when you're actually at 100 million. There's, there's a few things here. And it definitely took me some time to mature into the understanding that the company goals and the executive team's goals, they should come before any functional team's goals and resources. And as someone who grew up as part of a team and then created a team under them, it's very natural for you to be protective and territorial about your team. And if there's arguments about headcounts, everyone can justify why they need that headcount more than someone else. And if someone needs to cut some budget, then it should be always on another team because I absolutely can't live without it. But I think that's a bit of an immature approach, which I was guilty of for a very long time. And I think as you mature and you understand if marketing gets that headcount, but someone else cuts it and marketing gets that budget and someone else cuts it, but the company ends up selling less or moving slower, like nobody's going to win. So having that mindset of, okay, we are actually one team and it starts from the top and the management team needs to be very well aligned. And within that, all the go-to-market leaders, so sales, marketing, customer success, ops, all of those parts, if you're a PLG company, product is part of that as well. They all have to be super aligned and leave all their differences in that management room before going back to their teams. I've been at companies where there was this unhealthy rivalry between sales and marketing and we all know the classic story of marketing blaming sales for not following up on the wonderful leads that we just brought back from a trade show or on the website and sales looking at them. This is a random fishbowl with business cards of people who were it for the iPad that you were raffling in the booth. We're not going to call these people. It's a total waste of time. And that doesn't really happen at, at Gong. And or if it happens, it's maybe 5% of what I've seen. At, at other companies where the alignment was not as strong as it is at Gong. So at Gong, there, there's a, a really strong understanding and alignment that we're in this together and we can't win separately. And uh, I, I want to give kudos to to our outgoing CRO, Ryan Longfield, uh, who's now in a similar role that that I am at Gong. And he he showed me that there's a different way than what I've seen at other companies. I was used at other companies when a salesperson wins a big deal, they get put on a pedestal and they, they make the whole day about them. And at Gong, Ryan led a very different approach. When someone won a big deal, they credited the many people who got the meeting with that customer, who did the security review, who did the redlining in legal until the wee hours of the night before the deal had to close, who did the onboarding and the support and the training and the marketing event that was organized to bring them there in the first place. And they gave everyone a true feeling that sales is a team sport, which it really is, right? Unless you're selling your own time, you're selling a product mm -hmm. that someone else builds and someone else has to train them on and someone else has to market so they hear about it in the first place. Nobody can close a deal truly on their own. So when you build an entire culture that embraces that, it becomes a lot easier to share the successes and figure out when things are not going really well, what you need to do. So that's the high mm -hmm. strategy level. And then, as you mentioned, one of the kind of tactics that I found is when we were full-time in office pre-COVID, we, Ryan and I, had a weekly coffee run. We used to go and get coffee and chat about how things are going at home and at work and what challenges do we need to work on together and which areas are going well and which areas are not. And by doing that, we could go back to our teams, tell them, hey, I just met with Ryan, like, what's going on in mid-market? Can we be supporting him more there? I think we're doing well in SMB. And he would go back and say, hey, marketing is one, down one events person. Can we take some of the heavy lifting and invite some more people to the event to make sure we've got a, a full house? And just by doing that and then walking mm -hmm. into meetings together with a lot less finger pointing and blaming than I would see at other companies, because we really showed up as one team, as one go-to-market team, and they can't win without us and we can't win without them. So just having that state of mind and creating that close relationship. The last thing I'll say is, and that has to trickle down once the team grows and the teams grow. Russell, who heads up demand gen at, at Gong, he embedded himself within the SDR team and even took over temporarily managing some of the SDR team when we were short one leader. It was not his job, but he knew mm. that without them, we're not going to be able to convert those beautiful marketing leads into actual opportunities. I'll take the team and I'll manage them until we hire that next leader. And to this day, we have ABM program managers who are marketers and they sit in every weekly sales meeting, making sure they're aligned with all the regional sales directors, understanding what their challenges are, and then coming back to marketing saying, 
how can we help them crack this? We're having a problem in this territory or in that segment. Mm -hmm. They need our help cracking this. And we're not going to wait for them to come with a brief asking us how we can help. We're there in the meetings. We're hearing which accounts are difficult. And then we're coming up with ideas how to help them. You find uh, a huge amount of software companies have uh, everyone's one team or some sort of variation of that as a cultural goal, but actually living and doing things you talked about, go and have coffee every day with this person, spend time with them so that when you're in meetings, and I was probably over the top with this stuff, I made Ricky and all of my team meet every freaking day. We met every day and we were around the world. We met every morning and spent time with each other purely for that fact, right? So that's, meetings that's become less, yeah, meetings become less about, yeah, I haven't got this today. And so why can't achieve my number and more about Oh, as a business, we're trying to hit this and we're not. What can we do? How can we help? And when you have Absolutely. to do cuts and, and cuts happen and everyone has to do it, it's not a discussion about protection of turf. It's okay from a business perspective. What can we do? And the fact that you guys drove that down the line as far as you've driven that, I think that's a huge part of what builds success. I've always been a big believer. If you can get 90% of people in your business to walk in step with you, you're going to be super successful. It will, it'll happen. 100%. And yeah, I just, just to... to tag on to what you said about resources and especially when times are tough. I, I can remember at least twice where, where Ryan, our, our CRO, came to me and said, hey, Udi, I've got an open SDR headcount. I want to give you that headcount because I can see you need someone in RevOps to get us better analytics on which campaigns are performing well so we can do more of them. Go ahead, take that. And we need another ABM program manager. That's going to bring more impact than another SDR right now. Go take that headcount, hire the person you need. And that, that's rare and, and I wish it yeah. weren't. Yeah. Totally with you. One of the other key elements to, I think, Gong's success has been already talking to you. We had Chris Olob on the show. We also had Russell on the show. Is the key metrics that you drove as a business, right? I think, as you mentioned, Russell stepped in when you were down at SDR leader. But I think when you came in the room and the meeting, you discussed the same metrics. So did you lay that foundation very early on as a leadership team? And did you go, these are the must-have must golden rule metrics that we must look at every week? And did that evolve as the time progressed? Yeah, so th that's something that I, I learned the hard way in previous companies. I've seen marketing, SDR, and sales not get along because they're looking at different KPIs and they're compensated in different ways. And it's just, I don't know, it's like you trying to buy a croissant in Paris and pay with Japanese yen. They'll look at you like, what, what is this? And that's a lot of time how marketing, sales, and SDR end up talking to each other. If marketing is bringing these MQLs, which mean nothing to sales, because what is an MQL? Is this a guy who wants to talk to me? Does he have budget and authority? Does he want to buy? Oh, no, he just downloaded this white paper on the website. Then why are you bringing me this MQL? It's literally trying to buy a croissant in Paris with Japanese yen. This is not the currency we need. Understanding what that currency is and understanding that qualified opportunity is that sweet spot. And there's variations on it. I, I don't want to get too tactical, but qualified opportunities means this is someone that sales has talked to and confirmed that there is an opportunity to be had here. They may or may not close it. We don't expect them to close 100% of the opportunities, but there's a qualified opportunity. There's someone with authority and budget and need of the product. Now it's for sales to lose or hopefully win that deal. And so when marketing get into that headspace of how can we create more sales qualified opportunities, look how many likes we got on our tweet this morning, or look how much traffic we drove with this raffle to our website. It doesn't matter if it didn't create sales qualified opportunities and you're just going to annoy sales and the CFO and others by showing those vanity metrics. If you did something crazy and you tripled your website traffic for the day, by all means, show it off. But don't make that the bread and butter of your reports to management, to revenue leadership, or to the board, because over time, they're not going to care about it unless you can consistently convert that into sales qualified opportunities. So if you can do that, go ahead and report on the sales qualified opportunities. If you can't, that's the problem you need to solve right now. It's not reporting. <clears throat> totally agree. SQOs is where we got to at the end. And I think it probably took us a bit longer, but we got there. Um, but I think it was also a challenge in that not everyone understood sales qualified opportunities, right? They're, they're, it's an evolving thing that's occurred in the last four years. Everyone's like, actually, that's what really matters. Before it was all the vanity metrics, right? Marketers had to say, we're driving this much in the pipeline and you guys aren't qualifying. And then it became that who said, she said on who's qualifying what and was it not qualifying for this? And yeah, we evolved like you guys to it's the opportunity that matters. Everything else doesn't matter. But we had plenty of times where the numbers didn't look like they were very good, but then the actual qualified opportunities were way increased than what we'd ever got. So you had that 
disconnect between, okay, we're not driving as much through, but the quality of what we're getting is significantly better, which at the end of the day, for a bit perspective, is all that matters, right? And, and that, that's part of the mindset. If, if you assume everyone has the best of intentions and you put your ego as a marketer aside mm -hmm. and you, you are frustrated because you're driving leads and sales is not following up, one approach would be to get all hot and bothered and say, these idiots from sales, don't they see all this gold that I brought them? Why are they not looking to them? But if you put your ego aside and you put yourself in their shoes for a minute, salespeople in one way or another, they're coin operated. So they will take the next best action to get mm. closer to another deal closing. If they are not following up on my leads, that probably means my leads are crap. It does not mean that they're lazy. It does not mean that they're trying to be annoying. They just know that my leads are crap. And either they know I don't want to hear that feedback, so they're not coming to tell me that, or we didn't build that relationship of trust between us that they feel safe coming tell me that. So instead of following up on my leads, they're going to have to prospect and create their own leads or, or dip into each other's honeypots to get new leads. So once you have a healthy relationship where you can talk about that and say, hey, mm. we need to change something about the qualification criteria because ever since you opened something up, we've been getting a ton more noise and these crap leads that we can't sell to. So let's go fix this together. In reality, mm. that's one of the things that Gong has helped fix, right? Because in the past, like you said, marketing's data driven and they had data and they had all this stuff in sales and sales. And so now with the advent of Gong and others, there's data now. And so it's instead of being able to be like, they're just lazy and they're not doing anything. Now there's actually data to back up that, Hey, look, these leads, they're not effective. Look, we are having these conversations. They're having in, having them in a good way. And so it's taken a lot of that. I mean, this is the thing I love so much about Gong and some of the other things that we've seen come up. It takes away some of this. He said, she said, because now you've got data on both sides of the fence and you, if you still have an issue then where your CRO and your CMO are not working well, then as a CEO, that's your fault, right? You haven't made them build a relationship, you haven't built a culture to drive that out because it's no longer, hey, we've done all this and all the data sets, it's good. We've given it over to the other dudes and sounds like coming in. So what's happening now? You've got data. You can act that, and that's something yeah. I think you guys have solved or helped solve. I remember 10 plus years ago at other companies when there were arguments inevitably between SDRs and salespeople where SDR were trying to get credit for a meeting. And he said, oh, I talked to him. I know he has the, the, the authority. But then the sales lady, she says, no, I just talked to him. He said, he, he's not the right buyer. And they could argue until the cows come home. Mm. Now with Gong, everyone can go back, listen mm. to that call. You can hear it from the horse's mouth if she has authority or not. And the discussion is over. So that's just a very basic use case. But it's really taken away a lot of these just pointless arguments when yeah. it's like you me arguing about my shoe size. There, there's an answer. It's not a matter of opinion. I can show you my shoe size if we could only look at the bottom of the shoe. And so with Gong, you can look at the bottom of the shoe. You can see my shoe size. We don't have to argue about it anymore. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I, I love that analogy. Um, having been a raving fan of uh, Gong for some time now, Udi, one thing I really appreciated you guys did really was the product launch. What are some of the common mistakes that you, one can avoid? Because we've all been there in an assess environment where you actually roll out product too quickly, or you think this is going to be the best product that customers want. But how do you, how do you become so decisive as to this is the product we should launch? How does marketing get behind it? And how do you get the entire organization to actually follow the same direction and get to the pace really quickly? Yeah, a few pointers here. Obviously, we could probably do a whole webinar on, mm. on product launches and there's a ton that I don't know and could probably do better as well. But here are a few things that, that we've noticed that work really well. So like any piece of content or public facing content or campaigns that we put out there, you always have to start with what they want to hear versus we, what we want to say. Uh, the, the, the quickest path to a, a tone deaf campaign that nobody's going to care about is starting with what we have to say. If, if you let your product people lead with, oh, look at all these gizmos and gadgets that we just released go post that on the website and on social media. It's going to be great. That's the worst way to, to do something. So you always start with what do they want to hear? And in this case, it's understanding your customer's needs and how is your new product launch going to address those needs? So starting from the use case and which pain exactly it solves and why is it going to make their lives easier? How is it going to make them slimmer and fitter and faster and stronger? That's what the messaging needs to focus on, generally speaking. And then it gets a little nuanced. We recently launched a new product at Gong that for the first time plays into a category where there are some incumbents or legacy products. And so in the past, 
we always focused on the innovation and what we're doing new and how that's going to address an unmet challenge. In this case, it was a different reality since we're coming to a market where there are legacy software. So the launch messaging focused a lot on how our product is different from what's out there because we did not want it to appear to be the same or less than version. So a lot of it focused on the differentiation, but also that differentiation was not about, oh, our algorithms are faster or better. It's about, here's how we address your needs, Mrs. Customer, better than all these legacy products that are out there. So that's another point. And then the third point, because you asked about is the sort of employee advocacy and the employee activation. I often get asked, what secret software are you all using to get 500 or 800 employees to post something similar or at the same time? And it seems like they're hijacking my entire LinkedIn feed. There must be some really robust technology behind this. And the answer is no, there's absolutely no technology behind this. The way we get employee activation and, and mobilize everyone to share and comment and engage with a piece of content is A, by asking nicely and making it super easy. And two, showing them what's in it for them. So I'll give you a specific example. When I did my monthly onboarding classes for new hires, I always cover this and say, here's how you can help us help you. Here's how the LinkedIn algorithm and most other social media algorithms work. If LinkedIn sees a piece of content that gets a ton of engagement in the first hour in the form of likes and shares and comments, the algorithm goes, oh, this must be a really good piece of content. I'm going to show this to a lot more people so I can keep them on the platform and get more advertising dollars out of it. I don't want them to go to their Instagram instead. And gongsters, if you get a Slack message or a calendar hold or an email from someone on the marketing team saying at 8 a.m. precisely, we're all going to share this announcement about an award we won or a product launch or something else. You stop whatever you're doing and you do this because that's going to show up more as a result to your prospects and customers. And then we marketing can bring them back to you as qualified sales opportunities. And we're going to make it super easy for you. So we're going to give very simple instructions in the calendar hold or in the email invite. We're going to send you a couple of assets like images and videos that you can post. We're going to give you pre-formatted text that all you have to do is copy paste. If you're not feeling like Hemingway, you don't want to write anything original, just post what I gave you. And we do encourage you to get creative. So we're going to leave some areas for insert personal experience relevant that's relevant here or something else, but we're going to make it super easy for you and make sure you understand what's in it for you. And that's how we get these crazy employee advocacy rates of most Gong employees participating in these campaigns. That's awesome. And thanks for sharing the secret sauce, because I think what you just touched on is what a lot of us do one day is like, how does Gong get everyone to get behind it? So we quickly, it's so yeah. simple. I'm surprised more companies don't do it. <laughs> wow. So, Switching the gear a little bit, Udi, coming back to you here, you've had such an extensive career. What's been the driving force behind your professional growth and success? As you mentioned, you've been at a number of different companies prior to Gong. So what's led you to continue to invest in yourself? It's rooted in my childhood experiences with a bunch of different performing arts. So way back in my childhood, I was intrigued by magic and I did magic for 10 years. And at some point I took on music and I've been playing music ever since. And at other times I was involved, I went to the high school of the arts. So I, I got to experience and take part in productions of the theater department and the film department and the dance department and do some lighting and sound and backstage work. And I just love the whole concept of creating this experience for the audience. If you've ever been behind the set in, in a theater, looks nothing like what the audience sees. Mm. And I just, I love that contrast. And it's what magicians do, right? If you stand behind the magician, you're going to see something very different from what the audience sees. And I love creating those experiences and being in the know and behind the scenes. And fast forward 30 years later, I think marketing is really the profession that does that best. We're creating an experience for our audience, our customers, whether it's an in-person experience like an event. And if you've ever been to a gong event, they're magical because we think of them as not just getting leads in a room, brainwashing them with a the product pitch and pitching them out the other end after dessert. It's like, how can we create a magical experience for them that they'll want to stay here? Or they'll want to come back for the next one. That has allowed us to come up with a lot of interesting tricks and ideas for making the events magical, but then we did the same thing in virtual events and we try to do the same thing on our website and with our content and in our webinars. I think it's this insatiable curiosity that I have mm. of uh, what else 
has yet to be discovered. How can we make, how can we tinker something to make it even better and more exciting? And seeing this virtuous cycle create the snowball effect of these seemingly small decisions of let's go create the Gong Labs content series when it was just Chris Orlob and me, and then seeing how that escalated and turned into something that now has a following. Ooh, I bet we could also turn this into a podcast and a webinar, and let's do a whole speaking series about this, and let's get some partners to pitch in, and let's inject this into the product with an exclusive version for our users, and we just kept building and building. I wonder what else we could do, and how could we make this bigger and, and crazier? So that's been my driving force, but to be clear, I'm a tiny part of this huge miraculous machine called Gong. And without the amazing product, which is 350 people strong engineering and product team that created a product that people actually rave about, none of what marketing does could have been possible. None of the sales could have been possible. And just having this really healthy culture for all these years that is about creating raving fans, marketing cannot create that. In a paraphrase on a similar sentence on marketing, I will say that Brand is way too important to leave it to marketing. And that means that the entire company needs to get behind it. It's not a marketing project. If you want to stand for something, and that's what brand means. Brand is what people say after you leave the room. Jeff Bezos sort of famously quoted as saying that. Brand is what people say about you once you've left the room. And it goes for people and companies. If you want to be known for something, it can't just be slapping some lipstick on the website and, oh, now we have a purple brand. No, if you want to be a brand known for creating raving fans, then your recruiting coordinator needs to create raving fans when she sets an interview. And the tech support engineer, she needs to create raving fans when she's solving someone's ticket and making sure that they're happy. And then marketing can build upon that and be the custodian of the brand and externalize that. But you can't create that in a vacuum. Good point. So I think follow-up podcast is clearly going to be a magic show. That's 100%. That's that's a, a, yeah, 100% yeah. need to see that at some point. But if you think about, look, everything you said is is amazing and there's a lot of gold in here for, for people. And a lot of who we speak to are, are people who are up and coming, right? They're, they're starting their, their SaaS journey or their, their sub a million dollars and they're, they're, they're looking to go on. And a huge amount of what we're hoping people get out of this is just learn some tips and things that make their journey easy. Because like I said, it takes a lot of things to go right for your business to get to where Gong is. A lot of people have to be there and a lot of people are part of that journey. And generally, we all made a whole bunch of mistakes on the way to get to that journey. Is there any tips that you can think of when you think back and go, oh, geez, I wish I'd, I knew this? I would say, one, to go back to the point that I made earlier, get a really good mentor. And if you're lucky like me to have your manager as a mentor, great. If not, go and find that mentor outside. Today, it's easier than ever to connect with people. I connect with so many people every week that I don't have an official working relationship with. But if I have the time, I will let them pick my brain on something. And maybe in 30 minutes, I've seen this happen over and over again. In 30 minutes of a call, I can create some sort of shift or penny drop moment for them that will take them on a whole new trajectory. So find a mentor that you can speak with. There's so many communities out there, like Pavilion community. And if you're an investor, then the different funds have great communities. There's many ways of getting into that. Two is understanding that if you're a small company with a small budget, you're not going to win incumbents or other players by outspending what they're doing on, on paid advertising or getting a bigger booth at the show. So just get that off your list. And by trying to compete with them, you're just going to run out of money and they're not. So that forces you to a different type of thinking as in, what can I do differently? Not better than them because I can't, I don't have the resources. What can I do differently than them? that's going to give me an unfair advantage. And so when brand companies were spending all these dollars on paid advertising, I started with almost no paid advertising, but created such valuable organic content that thousands of people wanted to follow my social media, subscribe to my email, show up at my speaking opportunities. And that cost very little money. It was just putting our heads together, creating really valuable content that sometimes when you have a lot of money and budget, you become lazy and you're like, let's just throw money at the mm -hmm. problem. I think the, the quality of content that a lot of these big brands are creating is not good because they just can afford to be lazy. And if you cannot afford to be lazy because you don't have the money, then you might as well do the right thinking and create something different and valuable that will get you ahead organically. Oh, I love that. 
Udi, where do you see the future of marketing heading after this collision of AI and content writing and everything else that's come into the place? I think this is probably a faster, bigger shift than we've seen in the past, but it is another shift like we've seen in the past. I remember 15 years ago, marketers were feeling proud of themselves that they figured out how to not sit around for a week writing a quality blog post, but instead offshoring it to someone for $50 and getting 500 words back and like, I nailed this because we had to feed the search engine gods with content. And so now we're seeing a, a similar flux of people just using AI as their outsource for content and creating mountains and mountains of crap content. Guess what? The search engines have gotten past that stage and they're not going to reward anyone for doing that. So I think once the dust settles, we're going to see that there, there is no substitute for good human judgment and having an interesting point of view. And instead of using AI to generate the content, you can use it as a writer's helper, as an editor's helper. There's definitely no reason to have grammar or spelling mistakes in the age of generative AI. That I would argue there was no reason 10 years ago either. You just had to work a little bit harder for it. But now there's definitely no, no excuse for that. But if you are going to trust AI to create content that's going to be meaningful in your buyer's journey, then you're, you're in for a surprise. That's not going to work. AI should be used like many technologies to automate what can and should be automated and to guide and help or co-pilot you on what you are uniquely qualified to do as a human. And that goes for marketing and sales and other professions as well. That's awesome. Last question before we let you off the hook and move to quick fire round. What's the next uh, big thing at Gong? Now that we're days ahead of our general availability of Gong Engage, our AI reimagined approach to sales engagement product, I can't wait to see the hundreds and then thousands of customers that get on board with Gong Engage. We've already created raving fans through the beta experience. And this is really a huge part of Gong moving from a single product company to a multi-product platform company. And that's going to be very important into our future, whatever that may be. Awesome. Now we've got the easy stuff out of the way. We'll move to the hard stuff. Quick fire. Do my best. That's a point. I do not follow sports. I do not have a favorite sports team. There you go. Um, I'll tell, well, I'll, I'll take that back. My daughter recently started playing volleyball. The Brandeis Lions that she plays for, that is my favorite sports that, team now. Yeah, that works. Favorite music genre? Jazz and classical. I, I'm going to pick two there. And the combination of those two together. Okay. Do you play as well? I do. I, I play the piano and I play both genres. Oh, awesome. Favorite movie? Do you have one? Or if kids I movies? Think if I think of my childhood or, or early adulthood, there's a really silly 80s movie called Top Secret with Val Kilmer. It, it, it has held up the test of time. I've seen it multiple times. Go, go check it out on a rainy weekend. It's, it's like a rite of passage. You've got to get all the 80s movies out, legend, all those yeah. sort of things, and show them to your kids so they can look at you going, what the hell is this? Yeah, like, dad, like, yeah. how old are you? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> that does not even look real. I'm like, that is actually real. What you watch is not real. It's just a computer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You must love to travel with the family when you can, Udi. Favorite place to visit or the place that you haven't been yet? Uh, one of my favorite uh, has to be uh, Scotland as, as a big uh, whiskey lover yeah. and connoisseur. Um, I can't get enough of that place. And as a big food lover, uh, Rome cannot be beat either. No. Oh. I can, see, tough spots. I can see when we're in the US next that we're going to go have a bunch of food and whiskey, which is great. I like both. Yes. Absolutely. And he's going to take us to all the single malt whiskey spots. That's what I heard. Um, Absolutely. Hey, this is the this, this is what the whole podcast is all about, actually, Udi. Peanut butter. How do you like yours? Crunchy or smooth? Smooth all day long. Oh, there, uh, there, there's room for crunchiness in other areas. Peanut butter needs to be smooth. He will <laughs> never convince me twice. Peanut butter has to be smooth. <laughs> we always edit this out. Well, if someone says smooth, we'll just put crunchy on it. We always go crunchy. It's the best. That's it. That's all <laughs> I'll come out. Hey, Yuri, appreciate it. Thanks for, your, thanks for all your wisdom and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Sean, Ricky. This was lots of fun. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it.